uh, look at e-commerce 101. In college, the class that was 101 was always the first class you took, right, on any of your subject. So that's why it's called 101. And basically, we're going to try to give you an overview of all the pieces that one might have to know about e-commerce. That way, you will be in a position to decide where your business fits in and what you need to do if you decide to move or expand in one direction or another. E-commerce ranges everywhere from a PayPal button on your website or an a eBay account all the way to a full-service shopping cart where you have your own cart and you manage it you know, extensively and you do the whole, the whole full business online process. Okay, so that's the wide range, and we're going to talk about all the pieces that are there, regardless of where you're at in it, those pieces are there. So as you try to move from your PayPal button to something a little more like a shopping cart, you need to know those things that are not necessarily exciting, <laughs> not necessarily entertaining, but they will keep you from getting in trouble. One of the things that I have seen more times than I can count is somebody calls me up and they've had a PayPal button or something on their website for several years and things are going well, they're selling, but they realize that that's not quite cutting. You know, there it's just too much work to manage all that because it's all by hand. You know, PayPal doesn't do a lot for you other than take your money, which is good if you're just, but they're starting to grow and they want to know where to go. And when I start trying to explain all this to them, well, then you know, they're like, oh, I have no idea, you know, and, and it all, you know, really is difficult. And so I have, that's why I have the ebook. I send them the ebook and I say, here, read this first. <laughs> and then call me back if you aren't sufficiently already scared. <laughs> if you survive your heart attack, yeah. 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 your heart attack, call me back. And sometimes that is sufficient for them to just go off and take care of it themselves if they're technically oriented. So that's kind of where this presentation is. This is kind of an overview of the ebook. So. Everything I talk about is going to be covered in much more detail on the ebook. So that doesn't mean that you shouldn't ask questions. Please ask questions. But because this is your opportunity to get that little extra help. But realize that there's a lot more depth in the ebook. It's 28 pages and it's just filled with details about everything. And it, it's it's something you want to be wide awake when you read because it'll put you to sleep later. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a few It's meditating. <laughs> I mean, I try to be interesting, but some things are just really hard, you know? <laughs> I was a biology teacher, science teacher. I taught biology, chemistry, and whatnot for six years. And it's a challenge teaching educational stuff and, and making it kind of interesting. Biology is a little easier than chemistry, but still, it's a, <laughs> it is a challenge. Okay, what we're going to do today is try to cover these main core topics. What do I need to know to have an online business and why? What are the solutions that might help me get up and running fast, faster and easier? Okay. How do I decide where my business might fit in in all these choices you're going to give me? You know, I'm going to give you a thousand choices, so to speak. I'm exaggerating. What are the parts I need to start an online business store? What are all the pieces that have to come together? And what about fraud and how does that affect me? You know, fraud is a big thing, so you can't ignore it. So. You, you, you got to keep that in mind while you're working on it. What are the opportunities? This is a classic one of those things you find online in a business magazine. This is one I found oh, four or five years ago, but it's probably even more so now. But at the time, it was like 80% of American families have a computer. 92% of those households are online. And more than half of those households shop from home on a weekly basis. And I suspect those numbers are even better now today than they were back then. So, yeah, one fact that you might consider entering now, too, is how many people are now using pads and shopping mobile? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, that's one of the things I'll be uh, not talking about today, but the next presentation next month, we're going to be starting on a series on mobile. Oh, good. And talking about yep. mobilizing your website and how mobile might be appropriate for your business, your website, your whatever. Okay? Keep in mind that... A lot of the people that are currently doing some of those really cool things on mobile in terms of business have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So from a small business point of view, it's going to be more challenging. Okay? So <laughs> keep that in mind. <laughs> Which is why I haven't spent a lot of time on it because most of the people that I serve 
don't have that kind of money. But fortunately, there are a lot of tools now that allow you to turn your WordPress site into more of a mobile-oriented site. And those kind of things has lowered the bar for small businesses, and that's what we'll be focusing on. Okay, Field of Dreams. In uh, e-commerce, this is one of my favorite uh, uh, concepts, is that, you know, the whole concept, the movie, if you've ever seen it, is the build it and they will come. Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Keep in mind that I'm going to be talking about all the technical stuff today, but you need to watch your marketing and sales and focus on that as well. Because you've got to bring together the technical infrastructure, like building your building, and you've got to bring your marketing, and they've got to both come together. You can have a beautiful website, a beautiful shopping cart, and go broke yeah. if you don't pay attention to your marketing. So I, I, I'm, I'm saying this one slide to remind you that all the other stuff I'm going to tell you is going to be an empty shell without the marketing and sales. So, uh, critical areas, these are the pieces you need to bring together. Marketing and sales is right up there, you're implementing technology, which is what I'm going to be talking about. And, of course, you need to make sure that you are meeting a need out there, that somebody wants to buy it, and that you'll be able to convince them of that. And, I'll close on, and with that, the state of the economy. Is the economy such that whatever it is you're trying to sell is something somebody will buy? Okay, that's always a struggle small businesses have. Any business has. I mean, somebody as big as Microsoft is struggling because they didn't get into a lot of the uh, mobile tablet stuff soon enough, and now they're behind the eight ball. Yeah, I mean, Microsoft? How could they possibly be behind the eight ball? Yet they are now. Intel as well. Yeah. Powerhouse. Yeah. They didn't see the mobile processors coming yeah. at all. Yeah, so, you know, you don't have to be a small business to miss the boat. <laughs> you can be pretty big and still miss the boat. <laughs> All you have to do is look the other way for a second. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. So that's an important part of those critical areas. Marketing without appropriate technology is not good. Technology without good marketing is not as good. Mm -hmm. Your goal is to bring it all together. And so that's my slide on that. just want to make sure you don't lose sight of that while we get buried in all this technical stuff. Where are the customers? Well, this again was something from 2008. And it shows you that, you know, you've got your young people uh, are doing more uh, heavy on high-speed inter internet as you get down to your older people. Uh, they're less so. Uh, so it just gives you an idea. Those numbers have changed. They've gotten a little higher. But the point being is that where you target your market has to do with how appropriate it's going to be online. If you're targeting an older market, you've got a, probably a smaller market. If you're talking a young mobile market and you're moving into mobile, you're going to have a much bigger market. So you've got to look at where you're directing yourself and the, for, for grabbing the larger market if that's what you're after. Now, that doesn't mean your business isn't going to be targeting a specialized area that is high profit. That's always good, too. <laughs> so, <laughs> Accepting payments online. Basically... We're going to be talking about the payment service basics. We're talking about, about the payment network, and we're going to talk about how processing service works. We're going to actually teach you all the little gory, boring pieces that are back there that you should be aware of because it's somewhere along the line. You're going to wonder why so-and-so does it this way and so-and-so does it that way, and what you're getting and what you're leaving out when you choose that particular service. What you should know about fraud, we'll talk about that, of course, and guidelines are looking for a payment solution. We'll actually lay out some guidelines. It's in much more detail on the ebook. There's a whole <coughs> kind of a, a decision tree in the ebook to help you go, okay, if I want this and I want that, then I'll, I'll, I'll make these kinds of choices. They'll help you kind of zero down on it more. Payment services, dealing with sensitive data. Remember, you're dealing with people's credit cards, so you have to keep that in mind. So what you do and where you are putting yourself in that chain of events from the credit cards depends on what kind of solution. On one hand, if you use a PayPal button, you are completely out of the mix. You're just sending it all to PayPal. Let PayPal deal with it. And it comes back to you. That's one way to do it. The problem is you lose control. You lose control of your customer. You lose control of the process. And it's fine if you're selling a hard widget that you're going to ship. But if you're doing something like a service where you've got to get some feedback from your customer, you've got to know something about your customer, there's a lot of data there you're not going to get with a PayPal button. And because you don't get that data, you might not be able to provide your service. 
So there's a wide range there, from the very simple to the much more complex. Trust and confidence are critical. People do walk away from you if they don't feel like your website displays the kind of trust and confidence that they're going to expect to have online. So you need to make sure you present that in the solutions you choose. And therefore, your choice of partners is critical. If you are going a little more advanced, you might need a web developer or consultant. Choose carefully. The type of shopping cart solution is going to make a big difference. And your payment service provider is going to bring the glue that brings all that together in a way that you can manage your business properly. For example, with again with PayPal standard, I'm not anti-PayPal, I'm a PayPal certified developer, but I like to make sure people are aware of it. With PayPal standard, which is the very basic, cheapest solution, your money goes to PayPal. And then you have to then have them write you a check. So there's a step. It doesn't go into your bank account immediately. It's collected by PayPal. And if at any time PayPal doesn't think you're playing by their rules, they'll freeze your money. Okay? Which means, ouch, there are people that have had a lot of money frozen on them for months and months while they try to work with PayPal <coughs> to get the money out. Because PayPal, as, as that type of provider, has completely control of your money. And there are no federal regulations governing that part of their business. Whereas if you are working through a standard merchant solution, there are federal regulations that govern and that money has to be in your bank within three days. Period. Okay? So... There's a different game there. You have to decide which way you're playing it. Obviously, if you're a big business, you don't want PayPal to be having your money. You don't want to be contacting them to have them write you a check. But if you're a small business and you're not doing anything suspicious, then that's probably a totally safe solution. Okay? So it could be a non-issue for you. Keep that in mind that, that there is a difference. Learning to ask the right questions. Hopefully, you'll have the knowledge to ask the right questions. Finding the right solutions for now and scalability, being able to move forward in the future is, is a key to the kind of solution you select. Scalable, getting trapped in a dead end. I don't, I've, so many times people have gotten themselves in a trap where they just can't move forward anymore. They have to literally throw it all away and start all over again if they want to move forward. So that's something you're going to be thinking about. Comparing apples to oranges is the kind of thing. Okay, payment service network. These are the pieces. These are the little chunks that have to come together. Many of them will be hidden from you, depending on the solution that you just choose, and many of them will be right out there where you have to deal with them. The acquiring bank. That's the bank that is getting the money. That, 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 that's your bank, okay? The authorization. That's the ability of somebody to make sure that the credit was good and that the money can be transferred. Credit Card Association is a governing body that deals with your fraud protection, deals with protecting you and making sure that things are happening correctly. Customer, that's the person you want to sell to. Issuing bank is the bank that issues the credit card. That's your customer's credit card, their bank. Merchant account is what you get as a vendor to manage a lot of this stuff up here. Okay, that's your merchant account. This may be a bank. This may be PayPal. Okay, that's, that's filling that role for you. This is you, the merchant down here. That's you. Payment processing service, that's a service that sits on top of the merchant account and manages a bunch of the interactions between you, the merchant, and the various other players. That's why it's often times called the gateway. Okay? The processor is a company behind the merchant account that actually moves the stuff around. <laughs> it does the electronic transfers and makes sure it gets there and the transactional stuff that makes sure that when the money comes out of here, it goes into there, and if something happens, it gets reversed quickly before anybody ends up with the money and with, it. with <coughs> both the customer and the vendor end up with the money at the same time. You know, those kinds of weird things. And if you're into databases, transactional concepts are very important. The last step is the settlement. The money is there. You got it. That's the settlement. It's in your bank. And that's the last process. 
Yes. So where would authorize.net fall? Authorize.net is a payment processing service that uses a merchant account, tags into here, the merchant account tags into the processor, and the processor deals with all the acquiring bank and the issuing bank to authorize. <laughs> I didn't put them in the, in the exact order, but, but it gets complicated, right? <laughs> we will go through it a little bit more. Okay, let's compare online with brick and mortar. Brick and mortar is always easy to compare with because most of you see it happen in front of you all the time that you uh, might at least get some point of reference. Okay, the first step, online the customer checks out the shopping cart. That's the checkout stage. That's when we start getting there. And the merchant swipes the card and the point of sale terminal. Okay, those two events, the same. Site sends pay, uh, info to payment service. Terminal contacts processor. Payment service routes info, info to processor. Validates, processor validates info with issuing bank. You notice this list is shorter over here. Processor valid, so these two kind of come into here. Issuing bank accepts or declines. Issuing bank accepts or declines. Uh, result bubbles back to shopping cart. Terminal prints out result. So those are the, the analogies between the two processes. Notice that the online has to take a few more steps because it's it's uh, non-card present, which is considered a higher risk situation from mm -hmm. the credit industry's mm -hmm. point of view. So they have to be a little more careful, which is where being careful with the fraud comes in. The settlement, moving money, transfer of funds from customer to merchant, the payment processor versus merchant services, we'll talk about that. Um, just briefly, payment processor services, they hold the money and it's a manual transfer. That's PayPal standard. Okay, that's the PayPal standard. That's your button. PayPal has other solutions that, that go farther than that. That's I'm comparing the very basic PayPal button. Merchant account services. There you get direct deposit in your account and it's governed by federal regulations. And it has to be in your account within three days. Sometimes you will get what, what looks like instant settlement. That's because your your charge came in the same day they did the settlement batches. So, boom, there's your money. You go, wow, that was fast. It's just because they gather three days of charges and they, and they do a settlement. Okay. Fraud. Where does fraud come into all this? On the website, there are so many opportunities for fraud. Spoofing your site. Somebody can literally rip your site and make it look like you, and feel like you, but it's not you. Okay, so that's kind of scary. Yeah. <laughs> and it happens a lot. And it happens a lot, right. Yes. And I get to clean up the mess very frequently <laughs> when that happens. Is there a way to protect yourself? Yeah, it gets complicated, but yes, there, there are a number of ways, and it has to do with First of all, the fraud protection that the credit card services provide you. Uh, it has to do with the security of your server. It has to do with security of your, of your coding, of your system. So yeah, there, there are things, but it's not a perfect system. And you've got to be realized that, that a determined criminal can still do bad things to you. <laughs> uh, Phishing, using your brand. That's where somebody presents them, somebody with an email with your brand. And if you're a bigger company, your brand is trustworthy and stuff. I mean, I get, I mean, you all get these huge amounts of numbers from banks and from, from Facebook. There's a lot of Facebook phishing going on right now. Uh, you got this notification from Facebook. They want you to click that button so bad they can't see straight. Um, don't do it. <laughs> Log into Facebook, log into your page separately, and then look at your notifications. And you'll discover that most of them were frauds. But at least you went, it, went through it the traditional route. Don't click that email. How it do you know simple. not to click it? It seems simple. It seems easy. <clears throat> no. <laughs> Does anyone here know how to tell that you shouldn't click it? You never click anything. No, because then you wouldn't get anything done. Look at the URL. 
if the URL will appear in your browser at the bottom, usually the bottom left, and if it's a really, yeah, when you mouse over it, which is a really strange looking um, URL, don't click on it because it's probably bogus. Another thing you can do if you're a little geeky is most email readers have a view source, mm -hmm. and you can do view source, and you can see where it really came from. Yeah. Most email readers don't show you that on the GUI, but it's there, and that view source will reveal who the real sender is versus the uh, fake sender. Back trace those, and you'd be surprised how many end up in Russia and China. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or Nicaragua. <laughs> Just anywhere, yeah. Okay, credit card fraud. Stolen cards, stolen credit card numbers. Those kind of things can happen when people try to do the phishing, the spoofing. Protection strategies, just the basics are using your security code when you make sure that whoever you buy asks for the security code. Address verification service for you as a merchant to make sure the credit card is real. These things tell you that the customer is the person they claim, unless they've stolen the credit card and they have the credit card in their hand, if they've just stolen the number, they're not likely to know the security code. And they're not less likely knowing this, they might know the address, but they're not likely also to know that. And then you've got your authentication programs, MasterCard, Visa have their, their programs that you can be part of that give you a certain amount of insurance if something does go wrong, so that you kind of get your money back. Guidelines in finding a payment solution. From a, con from a merchant's point of view, you want it to be reliable and flexible. You want real-time credit card validation. You want to have a back-end tools for managing, like uh, PayPal has what's called the PayPal Manager for the more advanced solutions. You can go back there and do reports on what came in, when it came in, what something got declined and why, and, and there's all kinds of tools back there for you find out what's going on in terms of your whole credit card processing. Scalable can't grow with you. Sometimes when you begin, you can't be scalable because you're just getting started. But at some point, you need to think, is my solution I'm moving into something that I can grow with and expand later on? Integration with shopping cart types. I've had people that want X shopping cart, they get this solution, and then we discover those two don't come together. Okay, so you got to make sure you kind of be aware that not all shopping cart solutions handle all types of processing solutions. There's not a perfect match. You will find disconnections, so you need to kind of work those together a little bit as you're finding your solution. Don't wait till you're down to and you've spent the money and you're ready to... I've had one customer who, who told me all along they were going to use PayPal Payments Pro, which is uh, the next step up from the button standards. And we got to got the shopping cart ready to go. We're ready to go. And I said, okay, I need that. I need this certain information to put in the shopping cart. And they handed me other information. <laughs> and it ended up that shopping cart didn't support it. So it was like, oops, you didn't tell me that. And we had talked about this. And so you gotta you gotta make sure that those keep in mind that those don't always mix. And you and you don't go if you have somebody working for you to do this. Make sure you stick with the solution you told them with, and if you're going to change your solution, you discuss it with the person. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that they're going to tell you what to do, but at least they'll be able to go, oh, we better change here, you know. <laughs> Look into your anti-fraud features. Most payment processors have anti-fraud features. Sometimes they cost more, and sometimes some of them come default with the process. You be aware of that. Recurring billing, very popular. Get them to pay once, get them to pay again, and pay again, and pay again. And so many of your solutions now have recurring billing options. Some of them are fairly primitive, some of them are more advanced. So if you think your business might get into recurring billing scenarios, look at the recurring billing tools and the options available to you there before you get going too far, or you could find yourself, again, stuck, wanting to do something, but you can't. Okay, make sure that, that the opportunities for what you want to do are sitting there. And of course, trust. All comes down to trust in the end, too. <sighs> I gotta talk fairly fast because I got a lot of slides to go through yet. <laughs> <laughs> Can you guys hear that fast? <laughs> <laughs> Losing my breath. Okay, parts of an e-commerce site. Okay, we are getting to the last chunk here. Um, 
Okay, you have your basic website. That's, of course, the first start. You have some kind of shopping cart or payment page. This can be from very sophisticated to one single page. You have to have some kind of payment gateway. That's something to connect your website with all that other stuff we just got through talking about. And that is one of the core ingredients of that other stuff is some kind of payment processor or merchant service. And of course, then we're going to be going over um, right next to that payment process. Basic website needs to have uh, information about your company. You've got to build trust. You've got to build interest. Uh, product overviews is always a good enough, another good way to help. Those are just sort of marketing kinds of things you need to do about your company. Make sure terms and policies that you really spend some time there. Most credit card merchant services require that you post your terms and services. So you don't want to get into the process of getting your merchant service approval. It's like getting a credit card. And they go, well, where's your terms and services? <gasps> oh, no. And then you got to go off, and two weeks later, you finally give it to them. Good to get started on that right away. So you go, oh, where's your terms and services? You go, I don't care. <laughs> and terms of services basically have to do with how you're handling the money, what you do about refunds, what you do about uh, handling your customer disputes. All those kinds of things have to be there because the credit card companies want to know that you are treating their customers well. So that's your terms of services have to really outline how you're going to treat their customers okay, and how you're going to deal with them. If you have a problem later on, your terms and services actually will go to a big way of protecting you because you have very clear terms and services and you've done a good job of presenting those terms and services and you follow your terms and services, sometimes the credit card will, company will be on your side. <laughs> Remember, by default, the credit card company is on the customer side, not you. By default. So you have to really mind your P's and Q's and be well organized so that you can defend yourself when you say your customer bought something and you're owed the money. Okay? And your terms of services is your first weapon in that process. <sighs> Basic components. Okay. Your shopping cart is going to have, if you get into a little more sophisticated shopping cart, is going to have these little pieces. Okay, you're going to have something about your product or service. That, that falls into here. You, you should have some kind of warranties in terms of service for your product. That also protects you later on when you have, there's a dispute. You're going to have quantities, sizes, colors, styles. The sophistication of your shopping cart will determine whether you can handle this. For example, a PayPal button will have more difficult time handling all those options than, let's say, Payments Pro where it's all custom coded or, or a more advanced shopping cart. So if you've got a product with a lot of options, you're going to need a more sophisticated shopping cart. Whether you're selling one or two, you're going to need a more sophisticated shopping cart. Delivery op options. I've had more people have to get a whole new shopping cart because the shopping cart they had didn't help them outline the delivery options for their products and the kind of costs and delivery processes that they had for their product. So you need to be aware of what your delivery option requirements are as you're looking at your shopping cart. Will the shopping cart support those delivery options? State and regional taxes, yeah, that's coming. Uh, it won't be too long that everybody's going to have to keep track of their taxes. That's just going to happen. It's still spotty. It is going to happen, so you should be starting to wear it. Purchase actions actually when they click the button. Bang, I'm going to do it. Behind the scenes, you may need an SSL certificate. If you have a standalone shopping cart, you will need an SSL certificate. If you're doing something like PayFlow Link or PayPal Standard, then PayPal takes that responsibility. But if you are taking that responsibility yourself with your own shopping cart, then you will need a secure socket link. That's what SSL means. That protects the communication between you and the customer's browser. It encrypts it so that somebody can't get in the middle and steal the information. And your last step is to let them know that you they purchased it. That's notification of sale. That's the receipt. You send them an email. You bring them back to an online receipt they can print. That's that's that kind of, kind of final Yes, you bought it. And missing that can be a problem because the customer 
can feel lost and confused if they don't know that they actually bought it. So that isn't important for customer confidence. Okay, here are the types. I go through these types in livid detail in the ebook. This is the really, really simple version. <laughs> you have your traditional shopping cart, which is not everything but the kitchen sink. It's standalone at your hosting site. It can be commercial or open source, which means you either paid for it or you didn't. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean open source is free, though. We won't get down that road today, but but keep in mind that open source has its issues too. So just because it's free does not mean it's free. You have unlimited possibilities generally. Most shopping carts out there that are the mainline ones allow you to do just about anything you can imagine. And if you can imagine, you can customize it. So here, options are not a problem generally, though you need to make sure it supports in the way you want. Virtual cart is kind of like, well, eBay, Etsy, a lot of those are virtual type carts, where they kind of handle everything for you. You come in, you put your products in, they, they handle all of those little details for you and send you your money, so to speak. And there's many ways that that happens. I won't even get into that. But that's kind of a virtual <coughs> cart. It's not really your cart, it's not really on your domain per se, but uh, it does allow you to get into business rather quickly. It's a good place to experiment without getting too much overhead. So it's, it's not a bad place to be. And if you're doing something really part-time, it may be the perfect place to be. Okay, so I'm not trying to put it down at all. Uh, SAS cart, which is a software as a service, is what it means right here. That's a more of a traditional type cart that is being hosted for you. What's the difference then? The difference is they're going to put limits on you because they have to support a wide range of people. So they won't let you do certain kinds of customization, which may not be a problem for you. You may not need that customization. So it may be a good way for you to have a traditional cart at a lower cost, monthly fees, instead of having to spend, have, hire a developer to do stuff. They typically will have tools that allow you to customize your site pretty well, make it look unique. And often, most of the times, you can have your own domain attached to it and do all those kinds of things. So it looks like a traditional cart, but you get rid of some of the responsibilities and hassles. But then you also have limitations. So there's always compromises. Isn't there a certain amount of loss of control with that also? Oh, yeah. yeah. There always is. With, with control, with control comes hassle. <laughs> comes complexity. With great power comes great responsibility. That's right. That's another way of saying it. yes. <laughs> so, so you go down this chain and you kind of lose, lose control. But that may not be a problem. You have to look at your business and what you're doing. There are some people who absolutely love to work with places like eBay and Etsy and whatnot because they work. They do the job. They're happy. Hey, that's great. It fits. Okay, let's jump back a bit and let's look at that thing we call the payment gateway. The gateway, this people get confused with this term because it's kind of used loosely. I'm using it in the very strictest term, but you may see somebody else use it a little more loosey-goosey. The strictest term of it is the gateway between your cart and your payment service provider. That's what a gateway is. It handles the communication between those two players. Okay? In some, in some shopping cart situations that we discussed in the previous slide, all that's integrated into one package. You don't even see it. Okay? And there are two types of payment gateway. There is a payment processor versus a merchant services. They're two different people. Let's look at the difference, okay? On the right is patient services, on the left is payment processors. Okay, payment processors are governed by state and local regulations only, whereas merchant services governed by federal banking regulations. Payment processors hold your money until you transfer it manually. Merchant services 
the man, money must be transferred during the regulated time, which I believe right now is three days. Transfer is manual, transfer is automatic. Minimal rules and regulations, extensive regulations to protect businesses. So those are the differences. Make sure you understand them. And in most cases, for a very small business starting up, this is not a problem. You're dealing with small amounts of money, you're kind of getting started, then you can always move over here. So it's not a bad place to start when you're small. But don't try to get too big over here or you're going to start having problems. Okay, when you start depending on thousands of dollars coming through your system every month, then you want to make sure that money lands where you want it and you want to have the protections of federal regulations. PayPal offers both of those solutions, so that's not a problem. Division of Responsibilities, now we're going to compare, okay, what does my shopping cart do and what does the payment service do? How do those two work? Okay, your job is to, the validation of the cart contents and the validation of the user info. Make sure the user gave you all the info that you're going to need over here. Validation of totals, make sure your totals are right. And then, of course, generating that final receipt. Over here, their job is to validate that credit card and the input matches the card. That the credit card and the billing address match and the, the codes match and everything. They do the commitment of the purchase. They finally say yes and they validate that there's actually credit in that person's credit card. Okay, make sure there's money there. And they do the final confirmation, the legal final confirmation that sends you back to do your final receipt. So those are the two jobs going on here. Okay, let's look at some solutions. Okay, on the um, right are some solutions that are packaged. They kind of do everything for you practically. They handle everything so that you don't have to do much in terms of, of fraud, in terms of building the interaction, taking the credit card, and all of that stuff. Okay, they handle that for you. The ones on the left, you have to do more, this involves more programming. This is where you're going to have to get a programmer involved. Now, your, tradi your traditional full-service shopping carts will already have this pre-programmed for you. So if you get Zencard or, or Xcart or Magneto or any of those kinds of carts, they have already programmed this. They will have an authorized net module or they will have a PayFlow Pro module. And you need to ask them, do you have the module for this solution? And make sure you do that before you buy it or before you start working on it. Make sure they have a module for that. That's important. Many of those cards will also support this as well. It's just that you lose a little control. You send them off and they may or may not come back. Whereas the ones on the left, you have total control. You control every step of the process. So the left is the merchant account? Left is the merchant account. The right, most of these are the payment processors. Right. With the exception of authorized net, you can have a merchant account here and pay flow link. These two, you can also have a merchant account, but they also handle everything for you. Okay? So it's not a pure thing. Okay, I made it. <laughs> <laughs> You're still alive. I'm still alive. <laughs> These are the things that we tried to cover today. Um, remember the ebook, 28 pages, a lot more than I could say in 45 minutes. So there's a lot more material there. So I will be posting that probably this weekend or later, first of the week. I'll be posting that. So look for an email from the meetup group, and you'll be able to download not only this video, but the whole ebook. Okay, and thank you. Thank you. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask, talk amongst yourself. We have to be out the door by 4 o'clock, so we're going to be kind of putting ourselves up. But please, if you have any questions, let me know. Okay?